trial. Hi all, this is Michael, just testing for interpreters to make sure you can hear the source clearly. Just let me know in your language chats that you can hear the source clearly. Testing one, two, one, two, just making sure the interpreters are clearly hearing the source. I can hear properly. Awesome, thank you.
notepads ready to take notes for questions. So today, we're going to look at governing data and protecting privacy, reality versus on paper, a deep dive into the data system. So we'll be looking at um, themes today from each one of our panelists, things like privacy and protection from a, stake, a multi-stakeholder perspective. What is being protected, people or data? What is the collective understanding of data? The opportunities and threats in the midst of deriving value, successes and setbacks of legal framework on the data ecosystem. We have put together a dynamic and exciting panel for you today. We have online Pilar Fajarnes, who is the lead author of UNCTAD Digital Economy Report 2021. She's, she has been working as Economic Affairs Officer at the Digital Economy Policy Research Section in the e-commerce and digital economy branch of the Division of Technology and Logistics at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. We have also joining us online is Arturo Muente Kurigami, modernization of the state lead specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank, currently working on digital government innovation projects and knowledge, coordinating the digital identity agenda and data policies for the public sector at the Inter-American Development Bank. We have with us Mr. Benga Sesan, who is the executive director of, of, of Paradigm Initiative, a pan-African social enterprise working on digital inclusion, digital rights. He's also a member of the UN's high-level um, leadership panel. And we have Ambassador Nathaniel Fick, who was just recently sworn in this year as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy. We have with us Semba Mazabu, who is a cybersecurity professional and currently senior manager, IT and, um, analyst at the Information Regulator of South Africa. We have Peggy Hicks, director of the Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures and Rights of Development Division of the UN Human Rights Office. Sheena Gemaze Magenya, Women's Rights Program Association for Progressive Communications. And right up and now, she's coordinating the Our Voices, uh, Our Futures project. And last but not least, we have Florian Marcus, Project Manager, Proud Engineers. He has supported governments on the political and legal structural changes. Florian has worked on projects to rejuvenate digital transformation efforts throughout the workshop in several countries. So the panel will give their brief inter intervention and then we will entertain questions and conversations. So let's keep it lively, thank you. Uh, we'll now have Pilar. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I thank the organizers to have invited UNTA to participate in this meeting. I will uh, present uh, the findings for the digital economy report that we focus on cross-border data flows and development because we found that it was quite important to focus on data governance given the importance that data have uh, acquired uh, as an economic and strategic resource. Data can generate private profits, but also significant social value for development. Beyond their economic dimension, data can bring immense benefits to society, but also carry risk in relation, for example, to privacy and other human rights and peace and security. Data need to be shared, but with uh, guarantees that human rights and other uh, particular concerns are uh, addressed. If well managed, data can help us overcome some of our global development challenges, such as climate change and pandemic. But if they are badly handled, handled they can lead to the infringement of human rights, generate 
and equal development outcomes and other undermine the functioning of internet. Our common actions therefore matter greatly for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. We have seen in recent years how the amount of data flowing around the world has exploded, increased exponentially, but at the same time, the data-driven digital economy is evolving fast against the backdrop of huge digital divides and imbalances in the world economy. A, a huge amount of uh, the population of the world population still remains offline. And in the least developed countries, only one in five people uses the internet. Moreover, the benefits of the data digital uh, economy or the data driven digital economy have so far been unevenly distributed. Two countries stand out to harness most of the benefits from the data, the United States and China, which have huge uh, control over the main database technologies. And also, most of the largest di digital platforms that are in a privileged position to benefit from the data come from these, uh, from these countries, are based in these countries. And these large digital platforms are uh, strengthening their dominant positions along the whole world or global data value chain. Many developing countries are therefore concerned that they will become mere providers of raw data to global platforms while having to rely on foreign knowledge that is produced from those data uh, that are taken from their countries. At the same time, the global data governance landscape is highly fragmented. Governance approaches vary, vary among the main players in the digital economy. If we can uh, speak in a rough manner, uh, in the United States, the approach focuses on control of the data by the private sector. The Chinese model emphasizes, emphasizes the control of data by the government. And the, the European Union emphasizes control of data by individuals. And these approaches are also taken into the expansion to uh, get more data in, uh, in the world economy. And the, this means that the current context is one of tensions among these realms, these data realms. What do we see with the current situation on the data governance is that this silo-oriented data-driven digital economy goes against the original spirit of the internet as a free, decentralized and open network. Fragmentation hampers technological progress, reduces competition and opportunities for collaboration among jurisdictions. This is likely to have significant negative impacts for most developing countries. There are, uh, we have reviewed a number of national and international and regional agreements or regulatory frameworks in relation to data, but the conclusion that comes is that uh, the global uh, data governance landscape is uh, a patchwork of national and regional and international rules that complicate uh, the relations in the digital economy. And uh, particularly, regional and international regulatory frameworks tend to be either too narrow in scope, for example, they focus only on the trade area or focus only on privacy, and they fail to look at the multidimensional uh, nature of data, or they are too, too limited geographically. And data are really a global challenge. They need to be addressed at starting from the international level at different levels too. So these uh, regimes fail to enable cross-border data flows with an equitable sharing of economic development gains and uh, properly addressing uh, various risks involved. What we would see, would, we would see uh, on the way forward is that uh, we see an urgent need to develop a more balanced approach to global data governance so as to find a common ground for data to work for people on the planet. This is important to avoid further fragmentation in the digital space, to enable global data sharing, to mitigate widening inequalities, to enhance trust in the digital economy, to deal with the dominant role of some large digital platforms, and to account for the impact of some national regulation spilling over other countries. Ultimately, we think that the goal should be to enable data to flow as freely as necessary and possible 
while being able to address various development objectives. In this context, we see several policy areas that could be uh, addressed through data governance, which may include agreeing on definitions and taxonomies for establishing terms of access depending on the type of data, strengthening the measurement of data, data flows under value, dealing with data as a public good, exploring new forms of data governance, agreeing on rights and principle, developing standards, and also increasing international cooperation on the governance of the digital platform, for example, on taxation and competition policies. In this uh, uh, approach, we think that uh, the United Nations needs to play a key role because at, the, at this moment, there is a lack of a holistic treatment of data and discussion remain in silos. The United Nations is the most inclusive forum, and we see that many countries still remain uh, marginalizing the negotiations on data governance. So we also point to the need of a new United Nations coordinating body or mechanism for data governance. But we are leaving this open to discussion among the countries and the different stakeholders. We think that the global governance approach should be multilateral, multi-stakeholder, and multidimensional uh, to account for the multidimensionality of data. And uh, I would leave it with that because we think that the discussion should go from there on uh, having some innovative thinking of what kind of governance we could have from our our results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pilar. Arturo? Yes, thank you. Uh, Carol, I want to start Welcome. thanking you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, okay. So uh, I'll jump straight to it. I have a couple of slides I want to share, and I hope I won't um, consume the time we have being allotted. Um, so uh, I want to start uh, thanking you for the invitation, of course, and uh, to participate in this panel. I'm going to share a little bit what we've done in Latin America and some of our, uh, at least, uh, lessons learned or recommendations um, that, that we're drawing from, from the work we're starting to do here. Um, so I want to start with this um, um, map I used uh, just to showcase what has been happening. I, I use it as a, a visual prop, but basically what we are seeing is that these different um, agendas or topics that are related to data have been appearing and popping up you know, uh, in response to different uh, um, uh, phenomena that we've been seeing. Uh, so governments are starting to create groups around open data, uh, actually uh, come from the open data uh, kind of camp. Uh, we have the data security camp, we have the data sharing, interoperability, we have the access to information, which even sometimes confuse with the open data one. We have, of course, the data protection, the one that's bringing us here, uh, tech enthusiasts uh, working with new technologies, all based on data. Uh, particularly artificial intelligence, et cetera. And all these um, different sort of agendas are starting to grow and they're starting to, um, you know, uh, step on each other's toes. And what we're not seeing yet, and that's one of the things that we're trying to work with, is to create a coordinated, I guess, uh, a similar in, in, in nature to the recommendations uh, the previous speaker has uh, shared, uh, a, a layer of coordination among these different agendas, because that will help, I think, we think, um, uh, address some of the concerns that actually you've raised uh, as topics in this panel. So uh, what we've done, we've um, made a comparison um, around the data protection legislation available in the region. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, works with 26 countries in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Out of those 26 countries, 17 countries have um, data protection, personal data protection legislation. That's approximately 65%, which is a little bit around the um, uh, percentage that um, was included in the report. Um, we have two or three countries we're actually helping with their uh, draft legislation, and uh, of course the rest uh, do not have an active um, uh, legislation. The thing to, to consider here is uh, that it's not a binary um, you know, uh, uh, variable whether you have or not legislation. It does help a lot. But we have countries that have legislation that's more than 20 years old that is in need for a very urgent update that's not being sort of um, um, made for the digital economy. Some of them are pre-GDPR uh, and, and you know whether we like it or not, GDPR has set a bar against many countries are measuring themselves with. 
Um, so what we've done is this comparison uh, with the inter um, um, Ibero-American um, data protection standards. Basically, there's an Ibero-American data protection uh, network that consists of authorities in charge of uh, enforcing data protection in some of the countries in the region, plus Spain, Portugal, and a couple of other uh, countries in Europe. Uh, the standards are pretty much aligned uh, with GDPR. They were uh, issued in 2017, and we're uh, comparing those with um, with the um, um, legislation that we have in place in the region. So um, we did that. Uh, there's the uh, QR for the website, uh, if you can see it. Um, yeah. Uh, we also, in the same web page, you're going to find a survey with it uh, to 10,000 people in the region, representing 10 countries. Um, so we just wanted to know uh, about awareness on data protection and uh, whether they knew what exactly personal data protection was. And then we also analyzed uh, some of the initiatives uh, that appeared in response to the pandemic and how they were treating personal data uh, from the citizens that were uh, using those different, in most cases, apps. So um, what did we learn? Like I said, 17 out of 26 countries uh, that we work with, and, and I want to emphasize that because I think there are approximately uh, other five or, or, or so countries mostly in the Caribbean that we're not working with, but 17 out of 26 that we work with have a personal data protection legislation in place. Uh, like I said, some of them are, you know, even from uh, 1999, so they need an urgent update. Uh, down to uh, Belize, I think, approved uh, its uh, personal data protection legislation in 2021. We have Jamaica, um, um, Ecuador, um, 2020, I think Barbados, 2019. So. You know, uh, there's been also a, a, a sort of wave of countries approving data protection legislation in the last couple of years. Um, so the Ibero-American data protection standards, the data protection standards include uh, general rules for international transfers of data. And, and, and one of the things that we've seen is that difference that you were uh, mentioning at the beginning of the panel between on paper and reality. And basically, even if the legislation that we have in place in our countries uh, is pretty much aligned with the principles behind the standards, which, like I said, are pretty much aligned with the principles behind the um, European regulation. Uh, there is a lot to be done in terms of enforcement. Um, most of the legislation uh, allows uh, exchange of data with uh, providers in other countries as long as they have an adequate data protection or similar data protection environment or legislation as a country, the host country. Uh, but who's defining adequacy? who's betting, uh, whether those different providers, um, vendors, all countries, uh, uh, data um, legislation. Uh, it's something that's left a little bit to the actual uh, company that's making the, or entity that's making the uh, um, data processing. Um, governments in some cases also have a, a, a trouble with uh, using cloud services. There's one or two countries where they're actually decided that all uh, information from government must be uh, um, stored within the territory of the country. Uh, who enforces this legislation? How well is it done? And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we are seeing overall is this need for a strong and coordinated institutional framework. Um, out of the 17 countries, and, and we need to also understand, like I said, that many of these legislations are relatively new, but I would say it's about eight to 10, including a couple of commissioners uh, in the Caribbean that are, have been actually uh, um, created to enforce the legislation. There are some countries where despite having the legal uh, framework, don't have an entity that's uh, in charge of enforcing. And even then, uh, there are like several layers, right? So you have the um, attributes that the law gives the entity, then you have the actual resources that the entity has, uh, and one of those attributes, sorry, uh, going back about independence, about the capacity to um, uh, make decisions um, uh, independently, that has a collegi collegial um, 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 leadership, uh, it's, it's something that we're also looking at. And also the uh, uh, Arturo, sorry, we're going to have to come back to you. So keep those thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Just stay with us. Thanks. 
All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Atur. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to you soon. I'll try to save some time so that. <laughs> Uh, so when we talk about data governance and protecting privacy, one, one thing that comes to mind for me is, is trust. Because trust is at the center of all this. And unfortunately, whatever erodes trust, uh, violations erode trust, and whatever erodes trust as a community, we need to condemn. Uh, one number that comes to mind for me is 1.9 billion. That's the number of people who were cut off from the internet in the first half of 2022 not unconnected, but disconnected by deliberate shutdowns, like the one going on in Tigray, in Ethiopia right now. And I'm saying that because we're in Ethiopia discussing the internet. And I think it's important to have these conversations because we can keep talking about governance, we can keep talking about protecting privacy, but if we don't address the violations, we will keep eroding trust, and the people, the stakeholders we need to work with will know that we're just having a talk shop and we'll have all, that con all those conversations and leave the place and say, we'll see you again next year. And, and I think it's, it's really important uh, to talk about this. And, and uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, talking, talking about the, the region we're in today, which is, you know, which is Africa, we have a framework that, you know, has been in place since 2014, the Malabo Convention. And I think that a number of you know, sessions that this IGF has talked about it uh, and how, how worrying it is that we have only uh, eight you know, signatures so far. Uh, we need 15. Uh, you know, in one of the earlier panels, someone compared the number of signatures we have, which is eight, uh, to the number of countries on the continent, uh, over 50. Uh, and that, that points for me to how we prioritize. When we have conversations, we prioritize these topics, but when it comes to action, we don't prioritize them. And that's very worrying, because if our talk and our action don't align, then we may as well just not waste our time to jump on planes and jump on Zoom to have these you know, conversations and invest time uh, in them. So, and having said this, uh, I know that you know, privacy and governance must definitely uh, be deliberate. When we talk about data governance, uh, there are institutions. There are many institutions involved. Thankfully, we are the IGF, which is multi-stakeholder, so there are many institutions. We've got academia, civil society, uh, government, the private sector. But one central institution that plays a prominent role in data governance um, are data protection authorities, or whatever name you call them, uh, in various constituencies. And this, you know, this, this DPAs, one of the things that in our own work at Paradigm Initiative, and we did a study of the last 20 years, uh, the, you know, the last 20 years of data protection uh, on the continent, looking specifically at 30 countries, uh, looking at those of them who got data protection laws, uh, but don't have data protection authorities, those who have data protection laws and have data protection authorities. Uh, but one of the things that we found in our report is that as we have a lot more data, you know, mass data collection projects, in many countries, unfortunately, we don't have legal frameworks to protect this. And, and that, that also erodes trust. And I can give many examples of many countries where people have to give biometric information to multiple government agencies, and there is no legal framework to protect that. One of the things you know, we found in the study is also the fact that you know, COVID uh, was a period where we really needed trust. Uh, and there was a lot of data collection, you know, for the purpose of fighting the virus, killing the virus, uh, and things like that. Uh, and hopefully, WHO announces very soon that it's over. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, but one of the things that we also saw and, you know, documented in the report is the fact that many governments, while, you know, investing heavily in data collection, have not invested equally in protecting the data. In fact, one of the major things that we found was that there were violations by agencies that were supposed to protect data, and that, of course, led to many scenarios where citizens refused, and then governments had to literally force them and say that, you know what, if you don't do this by this particular date, you're going to be cut off banking or you're going to be cut off you know, certain services. And that, that you know, uh, is not where we're supposed to be. If we're talking about you know, governance, if we're talking about protection, then we have to strengthen institutions. 
we saw uh, the needs are obvious, uh, identified a lot of gaps, but one of the beautiful things we saw across the 30 countries we looked at is the fact that all stakeholders uh, now understand the place of data and are willing to commit time and resources to working together. And I think this is the good news that I have uh, as far as data governance and, you know, and, and protecting privacy is concerned, that gone are the days where it was just the remit of maybe governments and DPAs to talk about this, but now, including users, all stakeholders are willing to chip in and get us to move forward because trust is at the center of all this and we all need to contribute to making sure that doesn't get eroded through violations and other things. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador? Can you hear me? You're a very hard act to follow. That's uh, eloquent. I could listen all day. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be both at the IGF and on this important panel today. And I'm going to begin my remarks uh, with a short explanation of uh, how we at the US Department of State view data privacy and data governance. So data protection is a key geopolitical issue central to our strategic interests. It's central to our efforts to promote meaningful connectivity uh, to an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable internet and to a stable, stable cyberspace overall. I would be remiss uh, to take the floor today without commenting briefly on the importance of access to telecommunications, the internet and digital technologies and promoting and protecting the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms in modern societies. Governments should facilitate that access and refrain from shutting down telecommunications and the internet to isolate regions and inhibit information and free expression online. And here in Ethiopia, we applaud the Pretoria Agreement and call on the government to restore full services, including internet access, to all areas affected by the conflict. Data governance and data privacy are central to this call uh, to uh, put forward a compelling and affirmative vision for the future of technology. And we seek to work with a community of like-minded partners to develop shared approaches uh, and to demonstrate that we can develop policy solutions that reflect our commitment to strong and effective privacy protections while simultaneously facilitating the cross-border data flows that open market-led economies and societies depend upon. So just with that as background, uh, let me lay out three underlying principles on privacy and data governance from our perspective. First, uh, we don't see a zero-sum trade-off between protecting privacy and facilitating cross-border data flows. We can and must support both objectives simultaneously. We know that cross-border data flows are the lifeblood of the modern global economy, vital not just for large technology companies, but for companies and organizations of all sizes across all sectors. Data flows are critical for international cooperation on scientific research, law enforcement, national security, transportation, and ensuring people-to-people -people ties around the globe. But we also know that people, communities, and governments around the world are rightfully demanding stronger and more effective data privacy protections. Without strong privacy protections, people lose trust in cross-border data flows, and I agree, trust is the currency. We do not accept the view that effective privacy protections must necessarily impede cross-border data flows. Rather, we view privacy protections as contributing to a safer, more prosperous global digital economy. The second principle, as already mentioned earlier, is we, we need to focus on privacy protections as implemented on the ground and not just in the abstract. As we see more and more countries around the world adopting new or updated privacy legislation, the gap can grow between the rules on the books and the implementation and practice. With inconsistent enforcement and significant confusion among businesses and other entities on what exactly is required to comply with the law. And to build trust in the digital economy, we need to, to ensure not only that effective privacy laws are on the books, but also that market participants understand and follow them. And that's why data governance policies should be developed with input from the multi-stakeholder community who understand not only the abstract legal debates around privacy, but also the real world challenges of implementing effective data privacy solutions. That brings me to the third and final principle, which is the need for interoperability between countries' data privacy regimes. 
When we focus on the real world implementation of data protection, it's clear that there will be no single one size fits all approach. Countries have their own histories, cultures, legal traditions, and regulatory structures. They will thus develop privacy protections consistent with their own local context and the need to protect human rights. As countries develop their own tailored approaches to data privacy, some level of consistency and interoperability between approaches is necessary to ensure that as data moves across borders, it ensures effective protections. So in closing, let me use this opportunity to highlight one such effort to promote interoperability about which the US is particularly excited, the Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules, or CBPR system. The CBPR system is based on a voluntary data privacy certification that helps companies demonstrate compliance with internationally recognized data privacy standards. The CBPR system was developed under APEC, but current CBPR member economies are launching a global CBPR forum to all jurisdictions that share its objectives and its purpose. With a unique approach founded on creating practical compliance tools, the global CBPR forum will facilitate trade and interna international data flows while building on our shared data privacy values. To this end, we hope many economies, many countries will join the new forum and that many companies will pursue CBPR certification. If you're interested in learning more about the program, you can check it out. It's at globalcbpr.org. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Samba? I think we're back. So thank you for this opportunity, Carol. And to my panelists, I don't know, you'll be a hard act to follow as well after Benga. <laughs> so um, for my approach, we need to look at data as the new currency because in trying to answer the question of who we are protecting, is it the people or the data, it, it needs to be said that this data that we're talking about drives the digital world, all the internet applications that we use on a daily basis. And it also has a major role to play in the economic growth, especially on our continent. Um, the use of data has grown exponentially and the data being aggregated and shared amongst the highest consumers, um, especially in the marketing and insurance fields, um, has um, opened a door somewhat for um, illegal collections of data just to enhance the profit and the bottom line of these huge companies. And as noted, the enriched data sales have become a more important revenue streams in many organizations. So we need to look at how now the security compromises or the data breaches that result from this really affect how they affect the people that um, actually are the data subjects. So it's the people who own the data. And um, for our purposes in South Africa, our data regulations stem from our Bill of Rights, which um, say that everyone has a right to privacy. So if people have the right to privacy, their data is part of what they, they need to keep private. And no one will put the data subject first as long as the regulations that are being implemented are only on paper. So from what we have observed as a regulator in South Africa is that a lot of the compromises we've seen, in assessing the companies, we find that they have the measures in place, they have the policies, they have um, the, the way that they are doing the, the procedures, but the implementation is just not there. I mean, if we are outsourcing our development efforts, are we also uh, outsourcing the ethical role that we have in protecting the privacy of individuals? I, I think um, it's a very important question that we need to answer in terms of what is the broad spectrum of the ethics that we're talking about? Who, who do they depend on? Is it dependent on me who is making the profit or is it dependent on the right thing to do um, so, in, <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so, in implementing um, privacy by design in systems, for instance, 
we need to be able to monitor the, the people who are actually um, implementing um, this, these designs. What happens when the privacy rights of the individual, which could be boosted by adding encryption, clash with the developer's mandate to in achieve low latency on the system? So we want faster systems, but we know that um, by adding encryption, um, we will lose a lot of time in processing. So the inability to deliver bad news to management as well, especially if it affects the bottom line, is an indication of how we see this disjoint between the security measures on paper and the se actual security implementations on live systems. So we, need, we do need a global framework. I know that there is a lot of cultural differences, a lot of um, differences within countries in terms of their regulations. But in order for us to facilitate the, the cross-border data flows, we do need an equal playing field in terms of the data privacy regulations. That said, these privacy regulations should be aligned with each other if we are to achieve a situation where we can continue to use the data to grow the economies that are desperately in need of the opportunities that come with information processing. So um, in saving time and ensuring that we can have more discussions later, I will pass on to uh, my next colleague. Thank you so much. Happy to be here with you and I'm really looking forward to picking up a number of the great points that have been made so far. I'd start off though by, by placing this conversation in a framework of human rights. Um, we are talking about data protection and data privacy not as a matter of convenience or as a good practice, but because people have a right to privacy. Um, and the, in fact, data protection affects a broad range of other rights. It affects the rights to equal treatment and non-discrimination, access to the rights to health and education, for example, and also fundamental access to democratic rights, including free expression and free association um, as government access to personal data increases. Um, I'd also underline the points made by my colleagues on internet access and how while we, we look at the right side of this, we also know that the data uh, flow and, and data as a currency, as, as has been said, is, is essential. And so we agree entirely with the need to end internet shutdowns in this context. Um, the scale of the challenge we face with regards to data is immense. Uh, social media and search engines, uh, main source of information, of course, and income uh, stems from track tracking-based advertising, relying on collection and monetization of massive amounts of data. And the Internet of Things is, of course, a growing source of data being collected, shared, and analyzed. So in that context, we need to really look at where we stand, and we've already heard quite a bit about the legal frameworks that are in place. Um, the good news is we've really had a lot of work done on what are sort of the minimum requirements for um, effective data protection legislation, and obviously Convention 108 and 108 Plus are, are key examples there. Um, our office did a report on the right to privacy in 2018 that really po pointed to the key elements of that legislation, you know, requirements such as having a legal basis for processing data, the necessity and proportionality of processing data, a point that Pilar made as well, having a well-defined purpose within that legislation, and important points around the limited scope, duration of data retention and processing, data accuracy, data security, and adequate security measures, the range of data subjects that are involved, and the obligations of entities processing data and the institutional safeguards that exist. Fundamentally, and this is a point that others have raised as well, it comes back to the role of independent oversight bodies for these activities as well, and not only creating those bodies, but resourcing them in a way that they can do those jobs effectively. So with all that as background, where do we need to head? What are the key challenges in the area of uh, data protection and privacy? First, as we've said, we need better laws in a lot of places to make this work. We, we have seen progress there, but as Arturo pointed out, um, even when we have laws, there's sometimes work to be done. And um, we need, of course, as the ambassador has said as well, a multi-stakeholder uh, approach to, to making sure that those laws are truly responsive to the needs of all communities. So uh, engagement by civil society there as well. Um, we also wanted to point out that uh, one of the key flaws in some of the existing legislation is an absence of or weak rec uh, requirements for handling of data by public authorities. And this is an area where substantial human rights uh, concerns arise. 
as Benga has said. Um, we really also recognize, though, that even if we started from a good foundation on data protection, we're facing increasing and new threats in this area as we develop um, new uses of AI and data-intensive technologies increase. And so what we need uh, to think is a more accelerated and expanded scope for how we're looking at data protection and privacy, thinking along the lines of data justice rather than just data protection, and looking at elements and approaches that will prevent and mitigate data-related harms more broadly. Um, and, uh, and my colleagues have given me tons of examples of this, but just a couple. Um, along the lines of anti-discrimination impacts on marginalized peoples, we know that those are some of the areas where we've seen huge problems with um, data legislation and, and fraud detection tools uh, being used in social benefit systems uh, uh, is a, an example of that where it's gone horribly wrong. Um, we're also concerned about um, automated decision making and the minimum rights that people have to, to understanding how their rights are being affected by it and transparency around its use. Um, and, and systems around inferring information based on existing data and how we could uh, regulate those areas as well. And as I said, oversight bodies are a, a key element to making all of that work more effectively. Um, I too wanted to bring up the issues of cross-border data flows and localization requirements, which I agree uh, we need to find a way to, to square those issues within the context of human rights. Uh, we want data flows to go across borders, but we, and we know that data localization has many uh, pitfalls in a variety of ways. Uh, one, it increases government power over data and puts pressure points on companies that are perhaps not as useful. It further fragmentize, uh, fragmentizes the internet and has tensions with the right to freedom of expression and can be economically burdensome. So we agree we need frameworks that allow for personal data to be transferred across states, but we would like to see those frameworks protected at least by the level required under international human rights law. And so we, of course, look to the GDPR, which permits transfers of data uh, with a level, uh, adequate level of protection in another state. Um, and uh, also, uh, we're going to flag, as, as the ambassador has, the gloss, Global Cross-Border Privacy Rules Forum. One final word would be on the law enforcement side, where uh, law enforcement access to user data is a particular area of human rights risk. Um, and so we want to make sure that minimum safeguards are in place for those systems for a transfer of data, including requirements around dual criminality, for oversight again, for less invasive measures and limiting these, these transfers to particularly grave crimes, and to make sure that we have the relevant public authorities in place where direct access to data held by companies is sought as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I'm stumped. <laughs> um, it's a bit hard to follow after everything that everyone has said, so I will say what, um, what, what I want to say, but maybe it'll be similar but said differently. Um, I think it's important to locate myself as a member of civil society. I work at the intersection of um, human rights, in particular women's rights, LGBTIQ rights, and technology. And where I work is also situated around using a feminist framework to try and understand what's going on. So it's understandable for people like me and people and the communities that I work with who come to a space like this, it's a bit overwhelming because there's all these references to documents that um, we, we don't know about, right? And so there's something about uh, data governance and um, protecting privacy that's a bit obscure. There's something about the space that is also a bit siloed. Um, and I really like what you said about how we cannot look at the work of data governance and uh, protecting privacy in isolation as its own little space that's located around technology. Because when we do ask for data protection laws to be instituted in countries and states and contexts where there are already existing laws that are not being respected, it creates an issue of what Benga said, trust. So when you say that you want to put in place better laws when the already existing laws are not being respected, um, we, the civil society, are scared. We just think that it's going to be another law that's going to come and seek us out, especially if you are a decriminalized identity if you um, work in a criminalized um, uh, la in labor, if your labor is criminalized, for example. Um, 
when the government comes and says, and often by force, there's the option of choice never exists in a lot of these kinds of spaces. And often you find that um, laws that are put in place become quickly insufficient, especially if the focus is more around the data, for example, and not the people. And you find that how what data is shifts very quickly. What data can look like looks very different. Like for instance, we have the Kenya Data Protection Act that was put in place in 2019. Of course, after a pandemic, that looks very different. So now we have to go back and see, well, is it sufficient, given that we had um, a pandemic and the government used a lot of force to collect information out of its citizenship um, without the right protections, without any kind of um, consultation, without any kind of right to say no, which infringes on other fundamental human rights um, of the people. Um, I think another important thing to speak, uh, speak about is, um, and I think very many other people have spoken about uh, protecting privacy, which is especially important for communities that find safe haven on digital platforms, online, on social media. Um, when we put in place um, laws that flout the right to privacy, then we find that these spaces are no longer safe and there aren't any additional spaces for people to gather. Um, and these criminalized um, identities are further criminalized both online and offline. And the same kinds of violence that we experience offline uh, for having particular bodies across class, race, sexuality, gender, the same kind of violence uh, finds itself replicated in the online space <coughs> as well. Um, and in previous conversations that I've had with other members of civil society, um, the trust issue is quite big because you find that a lot of people don't understand and some of the um, data protection language is vague by design. So who is it protecting? Is it protecting the state? Because chances are if there's a data protection act of sorts and then my data is leaked, say, through an act of non-consensual distribution of intimate images, um, my right to recourse is less than, let's say, the ruling class, the political class, who can get a blogger arrested for calling out something and using the same laws um, that are supposed to protect a young woman who has experienced violence online are then used to silence and to subjugate um, citizenships. Uh, yeah. Um, I think another thing worth saying um, here is, sorry. Um, yeah, and so I think I, I would close, yeah, again, I would close with um, language that a lot of feminist and women's rights movements use, which is the language of intersectionality, um, and understanding that there isn't a single issue, issue, and when we do come here and we say that we, it is important to say, you know, the internet is an important space and that we need to strengthen uh, legal or legislative frameworks that make sure that the internet is free, these laws still exist within contexts where so many other rights and freedoms are being infringed upon. And therefore, when you say that I should be allowed to be who I am online in the context of a uh, of a, of a political reality where I am not allowed to be who I am offline, it creates a contradiction. And I think there needs to be, I think it, it, you called it interlopability. Yeah, <laughs> there needs to be an interlopability, a more intentional um, seeking out of um, uh, different actors across the various human rights uh, spaces and frameworks to see um, how can we lend more solidarity? How can we share more resources towards ensuring that we're not trying to see this as a single issue uh, space or a situation and how, how do we strengthen all human rights for all people in all spaces, both um, online and offline? <sighs> um I would like to start by saying uh, thank you so much to the IGF 2022 for, for the organization, of course, for the invitation as well. Uh, in the same breath, I have to say that 
in my opinion, this is a truly awful, awful panel, um, simply because we have plenty of experts and plenty of important topics in only 90 minutes, so I think uh, it deserves its own conference in the future. Um, if we, if I think we, we can start uh, with what was mentioned before, with the, with the area of trust. Um, I, I am a German, I've been living in Estonia for the last seven years, so I've got sort of uh, yeah, different experiences in that, that area. Um, if we're being honest, probably also in this room and also those watching via Zoom, um, if we're being honest, most governments and most companies today do not deserve our trust uh, when it comes to uh, the way that our data is being handled. Um, I mean, we can uh, throw manure at the private sector uh, all day long. Uh, we can do the same for the public sector as well. Uh, when I hear that uh, there are still countries, and not just in Africa, also in Europe, uh, just uh, everywhere around the world, um, that uh, duplicate citizens' data, uh, biometric data no less, um, that is absolutely unacceptable. And this sort of brings me to, to the two points that I want to come to, which were also mentioned uh, by, by Carol with the introduction. Um, what is the, what is the on-paper situation and what is the, the real-life situation? Um, well, the first thing that we have to do is fix the on-paper situation. Do you have something like the GDPR, some kind of data protection regulation? Um, the answer for many countries is uh, yes, not all, but we're getting there. Um, <coughs> but I also heard the previous uh, panelists discuss already about the, um, the desirability, perhaps, of a, of a global framework of recommendations for privacy. I want to, um, I don't want to shut the lid on that, uh, but I, I, I definitely want to put a damper on this because um, you know, looking at the EU where we do have a GDPR uh, with 27 member states that have signed up to it, um, I can tell you that we're not all following the GDPR in the same way. Um, and that is not because uh, one country is, is super smart and one country is uh, really rude, it's, it's just because due to different cultures, uh, we have very different interpretations of the same legislation. So even if we have a globally agreed upon framework, which will not happen, we will not come to an agreement there. But even if we did, we would not execute that framework in the same way. Um, very, very simple baseline example. Um, in Estonia, we've got uh, multi-story car parks with the tiny barriers in front, and they can read your license plate. Estonia is not the only country in the world that does that. Perfectly fine. In Germany, for the longest time, that was illegal because of GDPR concerns. And so Estonians were saying, you know, we've got the GDPR, so why can we make these barriers work with the license plate recognition, and why can't you? And so, um, and this is the, the tiniest example, and we can scale that up to biometrical storage of fingerprints or healthcare data uh, exchange across uh, borders. So, so there is a there is a myriad of topics um, that we number one we will not come to an agreement to, and even if we do, we will not execute them in, uh, in the same way. And um, perhaps I would want to finish on on one point. Uh, about uh, data privacy and governance um, from, from Estonia, uh, number one on paper, number two in practice. Um, in Estonia, we have something called the once-only policy. A uh, very simple rule says that across all the different government agencies, only one government authority can store a particular point of data. So, um, if the population registry has stored your data, because that's, you know, they're the ones responsible for that, the other agencies cannot ask you for the same data point. They have to ask from that authority. Boom, done. And the second point um, is not just about privacy uh, sort of um, uh, enforcement, but also about the r uh, how realizable is it per se how, from, the, from the citizen's point of view. In Estonia, as an example, there is a, uh, there's a, a sort of data tracker where I can see every single time uh, where the government looked at my data when and why. And based on that, I can then head to the data protection inspector. So it's very well that we have a, a myriad of, of, of DPAs around the world uh, that have some kind of enforcement capability. Um, but the question is, are citizens actually aware of their rights being uh, you know, infringed upon? And so I think this is something that we also have to deal with. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I told you we had an exciting panel, and I think that they've given you a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure we have some questions. Uh, please, anything online for us today? Peace. Okay, um, while Peace is looking, we have a few, whoa. <laughs> we have quite a lot <laughs> here, so we're gonna start with the gentleman at the back. And we're going to quickly make our way over. So we're going to ask you, please, don't give us multiple questions in one. 
So just give us one question, not with 100 parts. So thank you. Gentleman at the back. Identify yourself, please, okay. if you wish. OK. <coughs> thank you. Uh, uh, very much. I appreciate all the presenters. My name is uh, Asnaka from Ethiopia. I'm working with the Ministry of Innovation Technology. So I have no question, but I have a, an opinion. It is my interest to have this opinion. So according to my opinion, we need Ethiopians, the capacity building of a knowledge sharing program, a scholarship uh, program regarding to digitalization and good governance. And we need collaboration, cooperation and coordination and multi-stakeholder capabilities in Ethiopia. So I will appreciate if you have uh, any kind of MOU regarding to your interest. So we are open to our office and we'll, you welcome. So uh, young researchers must be, you know, uh, advocated in different sector of research, technology, innovation. So uh, young, uh, youngsters and children must be, you know, advocate or encourage uh, regarding to innovation and technology in Ethiopia. So if you have interest, we collaborate in, in terms of technology, innovation, and the project, and other, uh, other, other interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay, so at the front here, and then it's gonna move to the back. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm from Senegal. My name is Njaga from Civil Society Organization. I like to make a comment on data protection on, in Africa. Please give me a couple of minutes. Uh, one minute, the question one minute, is, the one question minute, please. Is data protection and privacy, reality or on paper? In Africa, it's even, it's not even on paper. Mm. We have 55 countries in Africa. Only 25 have a data protection act. The first African country that have enacted a data protection law is the island of Cabo Verde in 2001. The second one, Burkina Faso in 2004. And next from 2008, other countries like Senegal have enacted the law on data protection. Make note, since 2001, the island of Cabo Verde don't have, does not have a data protection authority. This to let you know that out of these 25 countries, only 14 have a data protection authority. And most of the time, that's the weak data protection authority. An example, in 15 years, any of these data protection authorities has never taken any decision on tech giant because they don't have the capacity. On top of that, politically, they scare because that's American interest, Twitter and Facebook. So that means that we have to learn from what Europe is doing, talking as one voice, because our small and tiny country have difficulty dealing with tech giants. Small country like Senegal, Gambia, Benin, Rwanda, what can they do against this tech? Nothing else. So the issue has to be tackled on the African Union Commission. And there too we have some issue. First, digital rights issue, are not listed on the agenda of the African Commission on Human and People Rights. Nothing on it. We don't have a resolution, we don't have a working group, nothing on digital rights on the African Commission on Human and People Rights. So we need more voices to advocate so African Commission can at least create a working group on data protection and privacy. Second issue, the Malabo Convention on Data Protection and Privacy, elaborated in 2014, so far, signed it by 14 countries, ratified by, by eight countries, and we need 15 to have it enforced. It. So there is a need for advocacy in each country to push for government to ratify, to sign first and ratify the data, pro, uh, the Malabo Convention. That yes, means thank, we need to you. bring more voices at the African Union Commission for Human and People Rights, and there we have another difficulty, we have few organizations that work on digital rights that have observer status at the African Commission. Yeah. So they we, we agree okay. with you and okay. you, the panelists, especially um, Benga, did go into some details with regards to that. And we do need to sit down and come up with a solution to that. So thank you very much for your input and we'll, we'll include it in our report. Thank you.
gentleman at the back. Yeah, thank you, Chair, for the floor. I will uh, process in uh, French, please. I will go in French. Je, alors, je vous remercie déjà pour le, le, la thématique très intéressante, le temps que vous preniez vos écouteurs pour, pour comprendre. Et euh, je ne veux pas redire ce qui a été dit sur la Convention de l'Union africaine, mais il y a un autre niveau également. C'est lorsque cette Convention de l'Union africaine sera ratifiée au niveau continental, il y a une deuxième étape qui est la transcription au niveau des, des sous-régions. Cette transcription des lois types, elle n'est pas encore faite. Moi, je parle par rapport à la sous-région où ça fait longtemps qu'on attend que la sous-région Afrique centrale, où la transcription de la Convention de l'Union africaine doit être faite dans les lois nationales, où on est loin d'y être. Donc ça, c'est pour rebondir un petit peu sur le process de notre collègue du Sénégal. Un point important, au-delà de l'aspect sécuritaire et politique et toutes les problématiques que l'on rencontre à avoir une, un organe fédérateur qui va arbitrer la cyber, la gouvernance Internet des data, ce qui sera très compliqué à mon avis à mettre en œuvre, il y a, il y a et là, c'est là que je voudrais insister, un point qui n'a pas du tout évoqué, c'est le côté mercantile des données. On sait très bien que les données, c'est l'or noir de demain. Demain, le continent africain va exploser en termes de connexion Internet, d'utilisateurs. Donc il y a une manne financière qui va, ah, quelque part, guider le marché, qui va faire un nouveau marché. Et cet aspect-là, vous ne l'avez pas abordé. Et je trouve que c'est regrettable parce que c'est là, cet, cet aspect big data et intelligence artificielle va bousculer les us et coutumes de demain. Et c'est la, la question que je voudrais poser. Comment pensez-vous que ça va réagir Pensez-vous que les États, pensez-vous que les États, un État A un État B va dire ben « moi, je mets à disposition mes données euh, pour, pour, sur le mode bisounours parce que tout le monde est gentil, tout le monde est gentil ». Certainement pas. Donc à ce moment-là, on va avoir un réel problème dans l'économie africaine pour savoir, et cette fois-ci, je dirais, je terminerai mon intervention, comment, comment l'Afrique ne va pas louper sa quatrième révolution industrielle au profit de nouveau des autres continents qui vont venir exploiter ces données. Merci. Thank you. Just before we go to the next question, I would like to ask the panel if they have any comments on the um, intervention so far from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the, the, the comments on uh, the African perspective. Um, I do, we didn't talk as much about the regional level, obviously with GDPR and the European initiative, it's, it's very much on the plate, but um, the role of regional organizations in this is something that I think is really interesting to pursue uh, further as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just have um, a supporting comment to Yaga's um, comments. In terms of um, the laws that we have and the regulations and how difficult it is really to implement it against the big tech giants I mean there is no real physical address where we can deliver a notice in South Africa for for meta for example we have to travel all around the world chasing them down just to get comment or whatever f it would be the same for Twitter or TikTok. And it's, it's, it's a real problem, and it's something that we really need to look at. Thank you. Any comments from Arturo or Pilar online? Yeah, thank you. I found the comments very interesting, but I would like to react to the last intervention from the floor, because uh, really, actually, I did speak about the question of the multidimensionality of data and that data are an economic, uh, an economic uh, resource and is really a factor for development. So that's why uh, we are uh, really uh, focusing on the, on the report and on our analysis. In the multidimensionality of data, we have to look at data as an economic resource and also the non-economic dimensions of data that we have discussed here in depth, also the human rights. And that's why is, there is a need of, to have a holistic view in relation to data governance, because data are more than an economic resource and more than a human rights. They are really involving many dimensions. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the middle panel, then here, and then we're going to come back. Remember, please, there are lots of hands, lots of questions. Anything online for us as yet? Um, okay, we're going to take one online, and then we go to middle, Hello? and then this side, and then back here. So please keep it short, exciting topics.
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Karu. We have uh, one online question. Uh, the, 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 the participant is, ask, is wondering if there isn't time to form a legally binding framework for cross-border data governance within the United Nations to prevent strategic misuse of data, national big data uh, from countries and is wondering if this framework could be, could, this kind of framework could help digital trust and transparency at the international level and could help the formation of an accountable framework. So it's basically asking about the cross-border data transfer. Thank you. Hello, could I, could I jump in? Hey, go ahead, Arturo. Sorry. Go ahead, Arturo. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone and distinguished panelists. I would like to thank you for organizing this uh, timely session. I'm Amir Mokabri from Iranian Academy Community. Uh, isn't time to form a legally binding framework for cross-border data governance within the United Nations to prevent strategic misuse of national big data of countries for illegitimate uh, purposes by some dominant government and international digital platforms? This framework could help digital trust and transparency at international level and could help formation of an accountability framework for uh, dominant actors in internet. And it could also guarantee development rights, the rights to development of developing countries and fundamental rights of users and prevent formation of new data colonialism. My question is that, what would be the contribution of Global Digital Compact to address this critical issue and to establish drafting process of United Nations Convention on Data Sovereignty? Uh, at the end, I would like okay, to um, thank you. We'll, my we'll, comment. Thank you, hello, sorry. Uh, we will just have to yes. take the first part of your, your question and then move on, my apologies. Uh, yeah, thank you. I would like to request my comments be reflected in session after. Thank you very much for giving me this support. Um, okay, I'll I'll just very quickly shoot this down. I don't think this will ever happen. Um, I, I think I alluded to this in in my in my first. Uh, uh, introduction as well. Um, ve very simple reason: uh, we will never be able to agree on this. Uh, also, um, anything that comes from the from the UN General Assembly or any any of those bodies uh, will not be binding anyway. Um, and uh, if we look at, I mean, even much much less controversial topics like disability accessibility uh, throughout the world, uh, there are um, some of the biggest nations in the world that have not signed up to this uh, today, even though it's been enforced for like 40 years now. So this will not happen, in my opinion. Okay, we'll take, oh, sorry, got in the next. Uh, just wanted to add there, I, I'm not disputing whether or not a, a legally binding treaty is achievable, but I think the point was also around the need for uh, global, you know, a global look at these issues, and especially given cross-border transfers, I think that makes sense. I mean, um, and we heard so many of, of the comments talking about the need for uh, approaches that take into account local context, but there are fundamental principles in human rights at stake where the idea of having um, set principles that we want incorporated into laws and, and making those principles clearly articulated at a global level I think can be very influential in making sure that we have the right types of data protection in, you know, across the globe from region to region and coherence across those um, approaches as well. So um, I agree, uh, probably not the time to push for the legally binding treaty, but uh, I, I do think that there is room to continue work on uh, global uh, key principles that, that can be agreed and, and used in, in data protection legislation and for oversight and other mechanisms of that sort. Thank you. Arturo? Yes, I know I, I wanted to say something pretty similar. It's that we may not be able to have binding instruments, but frameworks uh, agreements. Uh, I mean, the initiative that the ambassador shared this global CBPR, I'm actually going to take a, a, a very deep look at it. Uh, these kind of instruments are the ones that can help 
uh, create that uh, as the speaker, as the uh, person that raised the question said, data compact or or, or some kind of, of framework and initiative. So that's something that that can happen. On governance, we have the intra-institutional governance, which is required. Inter-institutional governance within governments that is required. Those two can be mandated within, of course, a country, but the inter-country, uh, um, the international kind of uh, governance, that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that, that, you know, requires uh, uh, sort of a process uh, that, that may be a little longer and, and will probably require the countries to be uh, looking forward to it. So, so I, I think that these kind of initiatives are um, definitely needed. But I don't see them as, as uh, the previous panelists said, um, as binding and, and enforceable. Thank you. Now we'll start with this, um, the middle section here. Um, just a moment. Okay, young lady in white. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, Jordan Katonko from Innova Bridge Foundation in Switzerland, and I just wanted to build on what was previously mentioned. Um, and it is evident that different countries are at different stages of development and ad adoption of um, data protection measures. And on a practical note, could you recommend any, um, let's say, uh, self-assessments, how countries can proceed or start to assess themselves where they stand on the data protection and data privacy in their own journeys? Uh, I know that, for example, EU has the G GDPR checklist for self-assessment, and I think that will be really useful if you know of any other resources that countries could use to self-assess and start to look at the issue in a more sort of standardized way. Thanks. I think that's a, a good request. So if anybody knows of any toolkits that persons can use to make assessments on the panel? Um, I, I think what you have mentioned as the GDPR checklist would be something that most regulators and countries are using um, because um, it is the one that we all are all trying to align and be comparable with in order for us to, you know, have, um, and that's why maybe in totally dismissing um, the attempt to go for a, a more a broader framework, um, that a lot of countries can um, uh, 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 maybe subscribe to is maybe a bit harsh, but maybe trying and finding the places where we are failing and rectifying and going again in an iterative manner because a lot of the things we are talking about today may not be for the benefit of the people sitting here. It may be for the benefit of future generations and we have to keep attempting. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel would like to make a comment? Uh, gentleman at the back, very back. Okay, um, my name is Ismail Ajawara from the Gambia. Okay, I have a question in regards to uh, countries like the Gambia that doesn't have any data regulation, data protection regulation at hand, but still they are still collecting data with regards to um, digital IDs, biometric information, and so on and so forth. So I'm asking whether that, what are the approaches that we could use, you know, either at UN level or civil society level to actually, you know, fasten the process of those governments coming up with these regulations. So because I think they're not going to stop collecting the data and with lack of regulation is a problem. Thank you. Perhaps a, a very quick word on, uh, on, on civic action and participation, uh, even though that's not my sector, absolutely. Um, what, what, I've, what I've seen in, in the past uh, around the world is that um, in election time, uh, we all vote on taxes or education uh, or on defense policy or anything like that. And perhaps we should rather consider the digital angle uh, of all of these different uh, topics. Um, so one of the things that, that I would encourage you and everyone else in the room to do, myself very much included, um, next time that we go to the polling station, um, we, we think not just about specialist topics, but also about the digital implications. And if you feel like there is a political party or anything like that, or a movement that, uh, that drives data protection and privacy more strongly than others, uh, then that might very well be one support, uh, worth supporting. Benga and then Peggy.
Oh, it's working now. Uh, so just reacting to, to Gambia, I think there are two you know, key things I want to say. Number one is, uh, and I hope you're aware, there's an ongoing process. Uh, the reality is that gov there are governments who deliberately do not prioritize data protection uh, because what that means is then they are admitting that many of the processes they instituted become illegal. Uh, I mean, I've given many examples. I, I gave some examples uh, earlier, and there's so many examples in the report we put together. At least 11 countries uh, where they do know that the mass biometric data collection is illegal. I mean, it's not proportionate, it's not legal, it's not necessary. So there's no incentive to put together you know, legislation to call themselves criminals. I mean, why would you want to do that? Uh, that's one. But the second thing is, I think uh, you as a citizen, regardless of the sector you're in, you need to hook up with other people in the country, and I'm not speaking just of Gambia now. It is our responsibility as data owners to push back. Um, you know, this is why I, I say that, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna get more complex. We're gonna gather more data. We're talking AI, we're, we don't even know what we're, what we're gonna talk about next, right? We're gonna get more data, and we need to push back and ask for data minimalization. We need to stop giving data that is not necessary. Some of it would mean that you have to ask more questions, uh, but I would encourage that please, you know, uh, link up with other people in, in the Gambia, specifically since you asked, who are working, uh, give one project and others, who are working, a paradigm initiative, who are working on that, you know, uh, data protection, so that the process can move on, and we need to make it obvious uh, to governments why this is also a win for them. Uh, you know, politicians will do the things that would help them win the next election, and you have that opportunity in the Gambia, particularly. Peggy? Just picking up on Bengo's point, um, absolutely. I was going to emphasize that you, you do have to look at why the data protection uh, regulations and bodies aren't in place um, and, and address those, those barriers. Sometimes it is, and we talked about needing good models, having the resources to put these things in place, and you know we should all support that to happen. But the reality is there are other barriers, um, and sometimes they can be political, as has been talked about. But I want to emphasize that even when national laws aren't in place, international human rights obligations still apply. And that means that when governments or others are collecting and using data in ways that violate the right to privacy, we have a human rights abuse that can and should be taken up by international human rights bodies. And just two examples of how that might be done. One is through the Universal Periodic Review, where each country is reviewed by the Human Rights Council. Um, questions can be asked by other states about you know, what is the status of your data protection law and, you know, how are you, how are you um, moving forward on these issues? And that's proved uh, a useful way to push for uh, legislative reform on a number of issues in various countries. Um, the second uh, thing I'd mention is, is the special procedure system. For example, there's a special rapporteur on the right to privacy and communications and other interventions can be set talking about violations of the right to privacy within a state to which if the rapporteur picks it up, then the, the government will need to respond to that as well. Um, so there are a variety of different mechanisms using international human rights law that might be useful. Thank you very much. Now, usually we ask each panel, um, each panelist to give a wrap up, but I think we, we've um, had a good rapport going on and the conversation, the dialogue is being good. So I'm gonna let the one last patient question from the young lady here, and uh, it, it has to be like 30 seconds. Yes, thank you. Actually, um, my question has been asked by others, but uh, just a quick question. Uh, actually, do you think that the current the FTAs could be set up as a basis to develop the global framework for transport uh, data flow? Is that accurate uh, enough, or should, should it be a base foundation for us to build on for global framework? the FTAs and the WTO negotiation. Yeah, that's my question, thank you. Anybody want to get that in the last 30 seconds? I want to thank my panelists for a fantastic job and the audience both online and on site. Uh, you've kept everything going. I think a lot of you have a lot of takeaways that you can use and I think the biggest takeaway that we can, can go with is that we ourselves, we the owners, need to make the difference with regards to data government and protecting our privacy. So thank you very much. Thank you, panelists.
future. Um, can we have the online persons just stay on so we can take a picture? Thank you very much, Bilal.